wait, wait, wait. So 12 doesn't want to support 11. 12 wants to be the main one and have 11 support 12. But because of where 11 is, 11's been the main one and 12's been supporting 11. So 12 can't be the main one. And so if 11 supported 12, then because where it is, who would support 11? Nobody would support 11. 12 would have to support 11. So they couldn't be the main one. I don't know. Okay. Yep. Fine. <clears throat> October 19th, 1940. Any German invasion of Britain has been indefinitely postponed. And with that threat removed, Britain has won the Battle of Britain, whether or not they realize it. So what happens then? Politics happen. I'm Indy Nidell. This is World War II. Last week, the fighting continued in the skies over Britain, even with the invasion postponed. The Chinese nationalists and communists fought each other in the field despite their unified front against the Japanese, and the British were victorious at sea in the Mediterranean. Here's what follows. For starters, this week on the 15th, the Italian War Council decides they will invade Greece. German leader Adolf Hitler is not to be told about this, though, but will be presented with a fait accompli. The Italians hope for a two-week campaign and will begin operations already at the end of the month. Italian leader Benito Mussolini had felt somewhat slighted when a German military mission entered Romania last week, since he hadn't been informed in advance. The invasion will come from Albania, which Italy now occupies. The thing is, there are a lot of problems that Mussolini is not considering, but no one, especially his senior commander in Albania, General Sebastiano Visconti Prasca, has the courage to tell him. I mean, just the supply and transport for an autumn or winter campaign through the mountains of Epirus to even get to Greece proper is going to be a nightmare. The preparations were chaotic. For mainly economic reasons, a large part of the Italian armed forces were being demobilized. Units short of men had to be reformed. The plan required 20 divisions, but three months would be needed to transport most of them across the Adriatic. Mussolini wanted to attack on October 26th, less than two weeks away. The Italians are not the only ones making plans for the future at the moment. From the 16th through the 19th, Japan negotiates oil supplies with the Dutch East Indies. They will supply Japan with 40% of production for the next six months. And I really like this quote about that. There are British attempts to block this agreement and to circumvent it by helping Japan's enemy, China. On the 18th, as they said they would, the British reopened the Burma Road to supply Chiang Kai-shek and the Chinese nationalists. The USA is also playing its part here. President Franklin Roosevelt says on the 12th, our course is clear, our decision is made. We will continue to pile up our defense and our armaments. We will continue to help those who resist aggression and who now hold the aggressors far from our shores. 5,000 Chinese laborers load $20 million worth of high octane fuel and military supplies onto 2,000 American built trucks. China is not going to be abandoned, it seems. Japan has its fingers in other pies too, though. They occupied French Indochina a few weeks ago, as we saw, in order to cut off the flow of supplies from there to the Chinese. And since the response of the Vichy French government and indeed the rest of the world was fairly muted, now Thailand's Prime Minister, Major General Plak Pibulsongram, thinks he can take back territory in Laos and Cambodia lost to the French. Thailand, known as Siam until last year, managed to escape colonization by Europeans in the 1800s, but still had plenty of foreign influence. The Franco-Siamese War in 1893 took Laos from Siam, and border adjustments in 1904 and 1907 left lots of people believing that there are many Thai people living under French rule. So border skirmishes are now beginning to test the waters, and they seem fairly serious. And speaking of waters, this week and the beginning of next, there are 11 German subs at work in the North Atlantic, and they sink 39 ships. Convoy SC-7, 30 ships strong, is attacked October 17th through 19th and loses 21 of those 30 ships. SC stands for Slow Convoy. They are attacked by a wolf pack of six U-boats. This same wolf pack attacks HX... Halifax, 79, a convoy of 49 ships, sinking 12 of them the 19th and 20th. 152,000 tons of shipping is sunk in just a few days. 
Following these attacks, the British decide they must increase their convoy escorts, but they can only do this by dismantling some of their anti-invasion measures. As a side note here, German U-boat heroes Gunther Prien, who sank the Royal Oak, and Heinrich Bleicherode, who sank the city of Benares, are both part of the action. Aside from shipping, there is other news from North America this week. On the 15th, Clarence Dykstra becomes Director of Selective Service in the United States. On the 16th, draft registration begins. More than 16 million men register, and the first drafts will be balloted October 29th. Actually, also on the 16th, George Armstrong is arrested in Boston. He is a British merchant seaman who has deserted, made contact with the German Consulate General in New York, and then returned to Boston to get info on shipping convoys. He is arrested before he can do any damage, though, and will be sent back to Britain, where he is the first British person of the war to be tried as a spy. He will be found guilty and hanged. As for Britain itself and the ongoing battle in its skies, well, Adolf Hitler has an Italian minister visiting him the 14th. Hitler says, let's wait and see what London looks like two or three months from now. If I cannot invade them, at least I can destroy the whole of their industry. The next night comes the most intense bombing raid of the battle. Nearly 1,000 fires are started and many shelters are hit. In fact, this is the night of the Balham station disaster. A German bomb pierces the underground and kills 66 people, buried alive. 400 Londoners total are killed that night. All that bombing has had one other effect. By mid-October, child evacuees from London to the countryside number 489,000. Any actual invasion of Britain has been called off though, and the Germans are not now going to win by air power alone. So Britain has really by now won the Battle of Britain even as it continues. Yet at this moment of great triumph for the RAF, and especially fighter command, the release from the stranglehold prompted not celebration, but acrimony, jealousy, and the worst kind of ugly political jostling. For example, the situation with Air Chief Marshal Hugh Dowding. Now, his time at Fighter Command had originally been up in June 1939, but then was extended to this year in April. Then, with war in France threatening, he had been asked to stay on until July. By July, the Battle of Britain had begun, so they weren't going to remove him then, but asked him to stay until the end of this month. Sir Cyril Newell is Chief of the Air Force Staff, top dog. But when Prime Minister Winston Churchill gets wind that Newell is even considering removing Dowding, he says Dowding should stay in office until the whole war is over. This was all in July and August, but after another month, Dowding continuing had still not been confirmed. Churchill got really angry, and Dowding was then asked to stay in office indefinitely. But this does not mean that his position was not under political assault. And since Dowding had never been one for politics, he had made some enemies by doing what he felt necessary to strengthen fighter command over political opposition. And Keith Park, who is in charge of Eleven Group, tasked with the defense of London and Southeast England, is facing a somewhat similar situation. He was not interested one jot in the ambitions and jealousies of his fellow commander in 12 Group, or about walking roughshod over Air Ministry red tape if it meant saving some of his precious fighters. Well, that fellow commander is Trafford Lee Mallory, and he and Air Marshal Sholto Douglas are leading a growing movement to remove Dowding and Park. Trafford is very ambitious, and all summer, he's been both jealous and resentful that 11 Group is given priority and seen as the senior group. He wants 12 Group to get the glory and also to get one up on Park. And the big wing formation idea that I spoke about three weeks ago is the vehicle to do both of those. Wing Commander Douglas Bader, who put forward the idea, is his accomplice. The idea, again, is that when a large German raid is spotted forming up, he will assemble a wing of three to five squadrons from 12 Group to intercept them over the channel. 11 group fighters will harass them as they head home, so 12 group and the big wing will have the main job. Like Lee Mallory, he was frustrated at being kept out of the action. Unfortunately, his ego was getting in the way of sound common sense. As I talked about, 
The big wing formations went up a bunch of times and were not effective, though that is the opposite of Lee Mallory's and Bader's claims, which are believed by many in the air ministry. The plain fact is that they take too long to form up and often miss the action entirely. And since their primary function is technically supposed to be protecting 11 group airfields, they are not doing that job. And the claims of what the big wing can do clearly do not make any sense. 12 group headquarters is Duxford, right? Well, that's a lot farther away from anywhere in like Kent than Pas de Calais is. Germans flying from there could reach Canterbury in 15 minutes. It would take half an hour to fly there from Duxford, and that is not even counting the time to form up. So Bader and company are overclaiming successes, and Park thinks he can just ignore this, but he is wrong and a coup of sorts is brewing against he and Dowding. The first attack comes this week on the 17th at a meeting chaired by Sholto Douglas. Park is accused of being too rigid in not embracing the big wing, and according to James Holland, must defend himself against Douglas and Lee Mallory, and Bader is there even though he is only a wing commander, even though they have no intention of listening to a word he is saying. The wheels are in motion. The first casualty, of all these machinations is actually Cyril Newell, who is forced into retirement next week on the 25th. He has lost political support, not just Churchill's, but also that of Lord Beaverbrook, Minister of Aircraft Production, who, with several other influential players, pressures Churchill to remove him. He is replaced by Sir Charles Portal. And that note from next week brings us to the end of this one. With dozens of ships sunk in the Atlantic, bombing raids over Britain and Germany, skirmishing on the Thai-Indochina border, and Italy deciding to invade Greece. So it seems the war is going to get bigger and soon, in both Europe and Asia. Italy is going to invade Greece, and it sure looks like Thailand will take on whoever is defending French Indochina. And the U.S. is stockpiling weapons and drafting an army. And there are Germans in Romania. And there is fighting in the skies of Britain and Germany. And invasions coming and going in Africa. And the Japanese are fighting the Chinese. Oh, it gets bigger. Of course it does, because modern war is an addiction. If you'd like to know more about Britain and British politics, and indeed international politics concerning Britain during the interwar years, you can check out an episode from Between Two Wars about that right here. Our Patreon supporter of the week is Dave Molnar. Your support on Patreon is what makes this show possible. So please support us at patreon.com or timeghost.tv. Do not forget to subscribe, click that bell, and see you next time. Mm -hmm.